Hello, welcome to Jewish Immigrants in the American Antiques Trade. This webinar is hosted by the Weiner Family Jewish Heritage Center at New England Historic Genealogical Society. My name is Rachel King. I'm the director of this center and I will be your moderator this evening. The Weiner Family Jewish Heritage Center is a destination for exploring and preserving the history of Jewish families and institutions in New England and beyond. We are an archive, educational center, and family history resource located at New England Historic Genealogical Society, America's founding genealogical organization. This evening, we'll hear from speakers Brian Greenfield and Erica Lohm about Jewish immigrants in the early 20th century who became experts in the American antiques field and helped preserve America's colonial heritage. Before we get started, I'd like to mention a few things about this webinar. You in the audience will be muted throughout. If you have questions during Brianne and Erica's presentation, please type them into the questions panel to the right of your screen. Following Brianne and Erica's presentation, they will chat with each other and me for a few minutes, and then we will turn to your questions. Please note that we are all broadcasting remotely this evening, so bear with us if we experience any technological issues. Um, and we thank you in advance for your patience. Even if we do lose the connection or if you miss something on your end, you will have access to the full recording of this session afterward. Now, I'm pleased to introduce our speakers. Brian Greenfield is Executive Director of the Harriet Beecher Stowe Center a historic house museum that promotes discussion of Stowe's life and work and inspires commitment to social justice and change. Brianne has previously served as executive director of the New Jersey Council for the Humanities and has been a professor of history at Central Connecticut State University. She received her PhD in American Studies from Brown University and has held fellowships with the Smithsonian Institution and the National Endowment for the Humanities and Winterthur Museum. She is the author of Out of the Attic, Inventing Antiques in 20th Century New England. Erica Lohm is the Peggy Ann Jerry Curatorial Associate at the Concord Museum in Concord, Massachusetts, a position sponsored by the Decorative Arts Trust. She earned her PhD in history at the University of Delaware and wrote a dissertation titled Heirlooms of Tomorrow, Crafting and Consuming Colonial Reproduction Furniture, 1890 to 1945. Erica also has a master's degree in decorative arts, design history, and material culture from the Bard Graduate Center in New York City. Erica will start the presentation this evening. Erica. Hi. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for registering and coming to our talk tonight. Brian and I are happy to be discussing a topic we're very passionate about, actually two topics, Jews and furniture. And tonight's talk combines both those subjects as we discuss two remarkable men, Israel Sack and Nathan Margolis. At the turn of the 20th century, these two left their neighboring towns in Lithuania and ended up in the United States trained as cabinet makers and possessing a set of highly in-demand skills they found great success in the american antiques trade as a dealer and furniture maker respectively as tonight's talk will show sack and margolis represented and exemplified a tradition of jewish immigrant labor and entrepreneurship in the field of american decorative arts a tradition that remains underexplored precisely because the work they did was behind the scenes and largely obscured by the high profile activities of the collectors, curators, and connoisseurs they serviced. Yet men like Sack and Margolis and the many other Jewish immigrants who orbited this exclusive world played an equally if not more important role in restoring and popularizing early American craftsmanship among the elite and the mainstream. Ryan and I look forward to introducing you to Israel Sack and Nathan Margolis, telling their stories individually before coming together and discussing some of the broader issues and challenges they faced as entrepreneurs, as immigrants, and of course, as Jews. And now I'll turn things over to Brian to get us started with Israel Sack. 
Thanks so much, Erica. It's such a pleasure to be here today. I'm so glad to be speaking and speaking um, with you, Erica, is particularly fun for me here as well as we look at these two men's stories. Um, so today what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the career of Israel Sack to explore the value and the possibilities of a career in antiques for Eastern European Jewish immigrants. And I should say that this was very much a two-way street. For as antiques supported these immigrant dealers' own social mobility, these new Americans profoundly shaped, and I think it's probably not too far even to say created, um, the American antique market. And in doing so, they guided how early American furniture was to be valued and to be understood, and even how we think about American heritage and American identity still today. This research is drawn from my book, um, inventing, uh, I think next slide please, um, Out of the Attic, Inventing American Antiques in 20th Century New England, uh, which looks at the development of the antique market in New England in the first half of the 20th century and traces the development of understanding of antiques from what I would call associational objects, objects that were valued because of who owned them or how they were used, to really aesthetic objects and fine art objects. And Jewish antique dealers had a profound role in that particularly. Now, when I researched this book and doing the research, I found that there were really quite a number of Jewish immigrants among the early dealers of New England's antique trade. And it was quite a surprise. In the city directories of Boston, I found names like Leon David, an Austrian immigrant who started out in the furniture repair business. Joseph Epstein, a Russian immigrant who came to antiquing from the junk trade. Phil Flaterman was a dealer whose 1929 auction became famous for the record prices that it had drawn, and he had originated from Russia. There was Flaterman's partner, uh, Hyman Kaufman, also a Russian immigrant. There was Samuel Tischler, a German Jew, jo Joseph Grossman, an immigrant from Lithuania, and David Jacobs, who came from Boston, uh, who came to Boston from Russia's Polish territories. And I found similar patterns in New York City, as well as similar patterns near where I live in Connecticut as well. Um, so I want to, though, focus on Israel Sack um, as I talk about this phenomenon in antique dealership, because I think that Israel Sack is an especially powerful example of the influence of Eastern European Jewish immigrants on American cultural identity. Today, we have a tendency to associate the heights of the antique retail trade with auction houses like Christie's and Sotheby's, but it was dealers that dominated the business in the 20th century. They provided trustus, trusted advice to collectors and to museums, and none did so more prominently than the firm of Israel Sack Incorporated. The firm, which was inherited by his sons, Harold, Robert, and Albert, operated for nearly 100 years, from 1905 to 2002. It was the premier vendor for early American furniture, due in large part by the knowledge and experience of the Sack family. In 1950, Albert codified that knowledge by writing the Definitive Consumer Guide to Early American Furniture, which was formally called Fine Points of Furniture, but is often referred to by the monkeyer of good, better, best for the classification system that he used to delineate different grades of antiques. The family's extensive dealings and experience with individual pieces are captured by the firm's archives today and are held at Yale University Libraries. There you can find documentation of over 2,600 objects that passed through the family's showrooms. But building that business was definitely a journey. And Israel Sack arrived at Ellis Island in 1903. He was barely 20 years old at the time, but his life was already marked by a willingness to reinvent tradition. He was born to a fairly prosperous family in what is now a portion of Lithuania, I believe is Kozna, I believe it's pronounced. 
um, he studied the Bible and the Talmud, and he prepared at that time to become a merchant like his father. But he also grew up under the oppressive rule of Russia's Tsar Nicholas, whose legal barriers and violent pogroms were especially dangerous to Jews. Eager to break free and to avoid the draft, he apprenticed himself to a cabinet maker at the age of 14. The work compromised his family's social status, but he reasoned that tools represented a universal language and would provide him with the skills to emigrate. At the age of 18, he contracted a local agent who specialized in smuggling Lithuanians into Germany, and he began the trip. It was a perilous one. Russian officials nearly caught Sack as his party camped for the night in an abandoned barn. But young Sack managed to tunnel his way out, escape into the night, um, and to do so before the Russian authorities broke down the door. Arriving in Boston after a year spent in London, Sack quickly found a job working in a cabinet street on Charles Street. The shop was near Beacon Hill, and it was owned by a man named William Stevenson. Now, in Russia and in London, Sack had crafted new furniture. But on Charles Street, he found a whole other industry at work. He found the antique industry. I think it's important for me at this point to stress how novel the antique industry was, especially novel as it was built around early American furniture. Victorian Americans hadn't patronized antique dealers. Instead, the closest approximation belonged to what was called the old curiosity shop, a lost category of retail that featured the old and the rare and truly sometimes the weird, um, but really made no attempt to foster connoisseurship. And Boston business records bear this out. In 1904, Boston city directories show only three businesses that are self-declaring as antique shops. But by 1918, the number had jumped to 28, and by 1924, there was 47 antique shops listed in the city directories. SAC had arrived in a moment of formation when the meaning and the value of old furniture was under construction. Now, I think similarly, it's important for me to explain that Sachs' arrival in the United States also coincided with the emergence of the United States as a world power, with increasing economic and military expansion abroad. While government policies and naval expansion provided those practical means for the United States to export and compete on foreign soil, U.S. imperialism also relied on a cultural belief in the superiority of American civilization. There was a new nationalism which required a cultural and artistic sophistication to buttress and justify national power. The nascent field of antiques quickly became one of the ways in which Americans crafted a cultural tradition to backfill that need. And I do admit that it's not without irony that I say that early American furniture, forms that were in the period of their creation, trying to imitate high style English furniture, that these same things then in the, the early 20th century were valued by collectors as expressions of American, distinctly American tradition and American identity. But that idea was certainly made explicit in 1924 when New York's Metropolitan Museum of Art opened the American Wing, the American Wing, a series of 24 period rooms displaying early American household furniture adorned and adorned with interior woodwork from old houses. The American Wing's seed collection originated from a Boston collector named Eugene Bowles, a collector that Sack had met in his early days working in Stevenson's shop. Now, in those early days, Stack stayed with Stevenson for only two years before he started out on his own. In 1906, he makes his first appearance as a businessman in the Boston city directories. 
the listing places Sack at 50 Charles Street and also connects him to a partner, Samuel Tischler. A cabinet maker like Sack, Tischler was a German Jew who immigrated to the United States much earlier in 1888. And it's difficult for me to know, based on the research, what role Tischler played in Sack's early career. But the partnership might have been one that connected him with a more established individual and someone who might have connected him to the Jewish community's larger economic and social resources as well. But these early years of being in business on his own was a time in which Sack transitioned from working as a hands-on cabinet maker, crafting furniture, to becoming a dealer, buying and selling historic pieces. Now, Erica will discuss this kind of line as well, um, the, but the ability to cross between craftsmanship and sales gave Jewish immigrants what we both believe is really a distinct advantage in the business. For Sack, working in Stevenson's cabinet-making shop first introduced him to collectors, men like Eugene Bowles, who came to the cabinet takers to get repairs for the finds that they were making. These individuals would then become Sack's first antique customers, his buyers, and that hands-on experience with woodworking also gave Sack the ability to oversee his own repairs, to discern forgery, which we can talk about a little bit more, and also to make attributions to specific historic craftsmen by recognizing the construction techniques that they were using. By the mid-1920s, Sack had expanded his business holdings to become one of the most important dealers in the field. His flagship shop was located at 85 Charles Street in Boston. At various times, he also had a hand in retail outlets on Boston's Milk Street, Beacon Street, and Chestnut Streets. He had businesses in Marblehead and Danvers, Massachusetts, and at one period in New London, Connecticut. And eventually, he moved most of his business holdings to New York City locations to play a much more broader national market. He also developed a hardware business, ISAC Fine Cabinet Hardware, um, which grew to include wrought iron, wood kernings, and reproduction lighting, as you can see here in this advertising as well. According to his son Albert, by the late 1920s, Sack was doing one and one half million dollars of business a year, quite considerable. But selling that much meant that Sack had to also purchase large quantities of antiques. And he did this often by purchasing groups of antiques from the early New, New England collectors who had been his first customers. Among the biggest of those purchases was from the collector George Palmer. Palmer belonged to a group of early Connecticut collectors. He himself was a cousin of Eugene Bowles, um, the collector who had whose goods had become the basis of the Mets American Wing. Um, Sack actually purchased part of the Palmer collection. Um, it's more accurate to say Palmer placed many of his best pieces at the Met. But in 1928, Palmer sold the remainder to Sack, and he also sold his mansion, Westomere, which was located in New London, Connecticut. For Sack, this mansion was a business investment. But once he owned the house, he took on the life of a wealthy American businessman as if it were his own. He moved his family into the mansion, and he resided there for over a year. To maintain a sense of lavish display, he kept Palmer's staff on the payroll, gardeners, maids, and all. This use of Westomere illustrates that Sack understood the importance of appearances in the antique business. For Sack himself, managing appearances meant prioritizing the cultural traditions of others very often. In his oral history, Sack related the story of how when he met with antique collectors, dealers, and suppliers over lunch, he would choose a restaurant reflecting his lunch partner's heritage. If his supplier was Armenian, 
he would find an Armenian restaurant. If it was Friday and his associate with Catholic was Catholic, Sack would eat fish. He summarized this approach saying, it's so much easier to be like the other fellow than to have the other fellow be like you. When asked why he only dealt in American antiques and did not regularly include European imports among his ware, Sack expressed a similar ethic of adaptiveness. He said, when I came to this country, I went native. But to say that Sack adapted and acculturated to his adopted home, I think is also to miss a little bit how much he actively shaped collecting and connoisseurship in the United States. It's of course something that's easy to miss, as it's what he did in the daily interactions he had with his customers and in the advice that he offered them. But there's this very interesting series of text-based advertisements which Sack ran in the magazine Antiques in the early 1920s. And I think that it provides us with a glimpse into the way he counseled his clients in connoisseurship. The ads are very distinctive. Um, they have uh, very, very often they are just completely text-based as this one is, and you don't see any images of the wares that he was selling. What they do instead is that they position Sack himself as part of the deal, right? That they position him as an educational resource, someone who is able to per help buyers navigate the confusing world of collecting and connoisseurship. The series included such eye-catching headlines as, as buy from your ancestors, sell to posterity, the special qualities which age in parts, and where honesty alone is insufficient. Each of these ads presented a kind of primer, instructing potential c collectors on issues such as selecting antiques for the home, understanding historic finishes, and of course choosing a dealer. The advertisements frequently combined both sophisticated analysis of the market with moral stories and provocative maxisms. Here is collecting haste spells inevitable waste, something he focused often, often on, the idea that patience was required and that it was also to, required to develop knowledge and discrimination to be a collector. This doctrine of discrimination allowed Sack to identify his value to his clients. It was how he supported value in the marketplace, differentiating between objects with different design elements and creating bidding wards for individual pieces, which rose value in the market over the early decades of the 20th century. Sack's sons also told how their fathers prized the nickname Crazy Sack, which they explained as a reference to their father's willingness to pay high prices. Contrasted against Sack's frequent admonitions for patience and discrimination, the idea that Sack was in any way impulsive or foolhardy in his investments is truthfully pretty suspicious to me. More likely, I think that he was deliberately using his own purchasing power to fire up the market on which his business depended. The next slide here shows a chest of drawers from Salem, Massachusetts. Um, it's a small case study which shows how Sack worked to promote the value and the prestige of a single object over time. This Salem chest of drawers was owned five times by the firm of Israel Sack. It was first purchased by Israel Sack in 1911. Um, following, it was sold to a collector uh, and I actually, I'll read the whole note that Sack wrote to describe this. He says that he first purchased in 19, this piece in 1911 for $150. And then he sold, I sold it to Emil Mohar for $350. In the year 1915, I bought it from Mr. Mohar for $750. And I sold it to Mrs. Washburn for $1,000. In the year 1930, I bought it from the Washburn estate for 5,000. I'd sold it then to a New Jersey dealer for 6,500. 
In the year 1935, I bought it back from the New Jersey dealer for 6500 and then sold it to Mr. Cluett for 7500 An updated record records that Albert Sack, his son, purchased that chest of drawers then in 1978 from the Cluett family and sold it to a private collector in Texas the year after. So incrementally bringing up the value of these antiques and if you look at the archive at Yale, also conducting research into the origins of those antiques and the craftsmen who created them, also supporting the value construction of their value. Um, being very successful as a salesman in antiques could be its own kind of challenge for a dealer because unlike other kinds of businesses which needed only to expand their manufacturing plants to, to meet the customer demand, antique dealers were limited by the rarity of their ways, wares, and so supplies were often a problem. And because of that, fakes were rampant in the marketplace. And for a very discriminating um, dealer like SAC, avoiding antique fakes were really an important part of the work. There were a number of kinds of fakes that circulated in the market. There were wholesale copies made out of either old or new wood. Those were the most difficult to produce. There were what we might call embellished originals, where genuine antiques were made more expensive through adding inlays or carvings. And finally, there were what were called assemblages. Those were new antiques that were constructed out of old parts of other pieces of furniture. And for Sack, one of the, his values was that he was good, because of his cabinet making background, in spotting fakes. In fact, he learned quite a bit about the craft of faking in his first employer's shop in William Stevenson's shop because that shop also practiced faking. And so he had a first-hand knowledge of the tricks of the trade, which he deployed to his um, customers' benefits. So I want to wrap up here um, by saying just a little bit about uh, the end of the firm uh, or the transition from, from Sack to his sons and the firm's legacy as well. Now, his need to secure a lot of antiques to, to buy and then sell um, created a bit of a, a problem during the Depression. At that point, he took advantage of the business slowdown to buy out one of his biggest competitors, the Jewish dealer Benjamin Flaterman. And the move couldn't have come at a worse time. As the economy continued to decline, Dealers like Sack and the other collectors began selling off their prized possessions and uh, trying to raise cash. By 1932, Sack himself was forced to liquidate in an auction that amounted really in huge losses. But I think it's important here to note that Sack had already made a transition. He had used the antique business to transform himself and his family. By the time of the stock market crash, he was no longer just a new immigrant. He was also a respected expert in American heritage. Through the medium of antiques, he became a regular associate with some of America's top businessmen. Um, here you see a record of service, um, testaments from many of the cultural leaders and businessmen who purchased from Sack um, that his son published when his father passed in 1953. He developed relationships that served him well and his family well. When Henry Ford was asked about being anti-Semitic, he denied the charge, citing Sack as a friend. Sack's, uh, for Sack, antiques also provided a real level of economic success. After the stock market crashed, he never regained the wealth that he had had in the 1920s, but he had used the money to send his sons to college. And that provided an important investment as his sons came back to the business and reinvested after the stock market crash. Using loans from friends, um, they bailed the family out of debt, and they established the new corporation, Israel Sack Incorporated, 
which maintained the family's position at the top of the antique business for decades. And now I will hand it over to Erica for our next dealer story. Thanks, Brian. Israel Sachs' life and story represents one professional path taken by many Jewish cabinet makers in the early 20th century America. And as you'll see with Nathan Margolis, uh, he took a different path. And while he and Israel Sack share many of the same hallmarks and experiences, uh, Margolis's story is a little uh, less well known, but uh, no less fascinating for what it says about the antiques trade and the role of Jews within it. Next slide, please. Nathan and his four brothers grew up in the city of Yanova in Lithuania, and he trained as a cabinet maker under his father Charles and great uncle Samuel, who had a successful business making provincial furniture for country folk as well as more sophisticated pieces for local Russian gentry. And I'll say here, this is the first uh, moment of intersection between Israel Sack and Nathan Margolis as they apprenticed under the same master. In 1892, when Nathan was 19, the Margolis family left Eastern Europe and moved to England. Nathan secured a job as an all-around worker at the prestigious Waring and Gillow firm, manufacturing fine furniture for retail. During this period, London fashion was going through a Chippendale revival, and Margolis received an entirely new education in late 18th century Rococo furniture. This passion would and education would serve Nathan well in the coming years, as he soon tired of working in a large firm and desired to strike out on his own. There was no better place to pursue such an opportunity than in America. As is typical in a story of Jewish migration, Nathan sought out a relative working in Hartford, Connecticut, who already ran a small furniture repair business. He provided Margolis with work and facilitated the chain migration of Nathan's father and brothers. In the late 19th century, the Connecticut capital was home to a cohort of antiquarians, collectors, and preservationists whose activities resulted in Hartford being called the center of the American past. It was also the scene of a rapidly growing antiques market, with collectors purchasing old furniture in poor condition and having it restored to its former glory. And in an age of mechanical education, fewer native-born Americans learned through an apprenticeship to replicate traditional craftsmanship. And so it fell to immigrants like Margolis, who had the skills and, more importantly, experience with antique styles of furniture to fill this much-needed gap. So timing and location worked out, and now all it took was a little bit of serendipity. And that happened when Nathan Margolis met Everett Lake, Connecticut's governor from 1921 to 23, at a lumberyard he owned. As the story goes, Lake admired the young cabinet maker's discerning eye for materials. And after commissioning him to repair an antique chair, he spread word of Margolis's talents to the rest of Hartford's social elite and the family soon established its own business repairing furniture, as well as buying and restoring old pieces to sell. When Nathan first opened his shop, customers stopped by to pursue the selection of old candle stands or tea tables, only to find them sold upon their return. Nathan would tell them, don't worry, I can make you a better one myself. He soon realized that a nice reproduction might fetch a better price than a poor antique, and thus Margolis pivoted his focus and soon advertised his reproduction services to the community. While there was always concern over fakes and forgery in the world of antiques, a good reproduction was an entirely different creature, and one that was not only perfectly acceptable for the discerning client, but outright endorsed by some of the leading tastemakers of the day. One might commission a reproduction to fill a gap in a collection or to complete a set of furniture, while another might admire a piece in a museum or an auction catalog and want a copy for themselves. Many considered a one-of-a-kind reproduction an appropriate gift for a wedding, anniversary, or retirement, and the Margolis firm made them for everyone. So a good reproduction had everything to do with what it looked like and how it was made. Certain standards had to be met to distinguish an authentic replica of an antique 
from a generic colonial style piece produced in Grand Rapids. And Nathan Margolis's shop exemplified the former. Let me take you through this process with an example of a side chair made by Margolis in the 1910s. This chair was based on a late 18th century neoclassical form referred to as a shield back chair, popularized by English cabinet makers, George Heppelwhite and Thomas Sheraton in the 18th century. Margolis might have encountered the original chair in an auction catalog as the design appears multiple times in his personal archive of over a thousand clippings from antiques publications. Equally likely is that he sourced the pattern from a private collection suggested by the wooden templates his workers made of the component parts of the chair, including the center splat. Many cabinet makers in the trade who restored furniture was careful to take measurements and drawings of those designs and they would later use them in their reproduction business and this was seen as perfectly fine and legitimate. As you can see, these templates were used to fabricate a chair in the Margolis workshop, which was staffed with fewer than 10 cabinet makers, all of them Eastern European Jewish immigrants. Margolis's men used expensive materials like Cuban and Santo Domingo mahogany, and workers cut, assembled, and finished the piece at the workbench. They used tools like a molding plane to, re to create the beading along the edges of the chair, or chisels to cut away wood and create intricate designs. Margolis ensured all the detailed work was done by hand, though modern steam power tools did speed up cutting, sanding, and smoothing wood. This kind of bespoke, careful work set the Margolis shop apart from the competition. Nathan and his workers had access to some of the great antique collections and became particularly adept at making their furniture look as good, if not better, than the original. And I want to pause here to make it clear that, you know, Jews were not the only group of immigrants who made their mark in this specialized trade. And in my research, I have uncovered examples of German, English, and Italian cabinet makers as well. But like Brian mentioned, you know, Jews were disproportionately represented in this field. And not because they were more talented or possessed some sort of innate knowledge of craftsmanship, but for the simple reason that Jews, more so than any other immigrant group during this time, uh, had a well-established model of using social networks to find work in trades already occupied by other Jews. And you see this in the garment trade. People, you know, we stick together. This was certainly apparent in Hartford as the success of Margolis encouraged the continued migration of skilled Jewish artisans from Lithuania, including Abraham Feinberg, Anton Mislevitz, Abraham Aronofsky, and Barney Rappaport. They began as employees and Margolis' shop before establishing their own business in Hartford. The success of the Margolis shop did not necessarily mean that Margolis was in any way a national figure, at least not like Israel Sack. But for those in the know, he was a big deal. And one of the most important those in the know was Wallace Nutting. Most people would recognize the name Wallace Nutting. He was a collector and dealer of early American furniture and perhaps best known for his popular prints depicting an idealized vision of colonial America. And in 1917, Nutting decided to branch out and begin making reproductions of the pilgrim furniture he so admired. But unlike the Margolis model, Nutting batch produced his furniture in a more industrialized setting for wider distribution selling through retail and catalog order. It's worth noting that the hands that crafted Wallace Nutting's catalog furniture belonged to immigrants of a different sort, Anglo-Saxon, Scandinavian, and French-Canadian woodworkers, with native-born Americans doing low-skilled tasks. The decision to hire a certain kind of immigrant worker reflected Nutting's own nativism, which informed the marketing of his products as remedies for those beset by alien faces and languages. But while Nutting preferred workers who were less ethnic than others, one of his most valuable collaborators was himself a Jewish Lithuanian immigrant named Morris Schwartz, who owned a furniture shop in Hartford. In fact, Nutting credits Schwartz with identifying and restoring several of the pieces Nutting sold as a dealer. And Schwartz would also restore many pieces for the Metropolitan Museum of Art between 1912 and 25. All this to say that Nutting relied on Jewish skill in his career as a dealer. And in fact, he acknowledged that Nathan Margolis made the best furniture in America. 
I introduced nutting because I want to underscore what made the Margolis shop special. It's not just that Nathan and his workers made things by hand or that they were making really good copies of antiques. It's that they prided themselves on making the most beautiful furniture they could in a continuation of long established traditions of craftsmanship that stretched back centuries. They wanted to make pieces that would be the antiques of the future. And this mandate continued after Nathan Margolis unexpectedly died in 1925 at the age of 52. At the time, his son Harold was only 19 years old and had limited cabinet making training himself, but he was determined to continue his father's legacy. So he took over the shop and directed his cabinet makers to continue making furniture the way they always had. And this certainly pleased their clients, who included Wallace Nutting. Although in Nutting's case, his pleasure was not solely good intentioned. And I would like to sort of uh, expand that by introducing a case study, a little detour, to examine two nearly identical Connecticut sunflower chests made by Nutting's firm and the Margolis shop. In his time as a collector and dealer, Wallace Nutting encountered several 17th century oak chests made in the Hartford area by Peter Blinn. Referred to as sunflower chests for their distinctive ornamentation, they became highly collectible antiques. This chest was one of several museum pieces that Nutting had his workers reproduce beginning in the 1920s. Nutting charged customers between $250 and $275 for a copy, the equivalent of $4,000 today. From the standpoint of craftsmanship, it was not difficult for Nutting's workers to construct the basic framework of the piece, but a closer look at the designs carved into the three central panels reveals where Nutting's efforts fell short of the real thing. Nutting's workers made cardboard stencil templates for the design, which they purposefully altered to be easier to carve. As you can see, Nutting's patterns are bulkier and abstracted, lacking the intricacy and depth of the original. Though not necessarily a referendum on the skill of Nutting's workers, this adaptation was done to maximize the output of this highly sought after reproduction. In 1925, Nutting donated his collection of antiques to the Wadsworth Athenaeum in Hartford. Shortly after, the Nathan Margolis shop received an order to reproduce the same Peter Blinn Connecticut sunflower chest. And this order was from none other than Morris Schwartz who acted as Nutting's associate. And the pieces were to be sent to Nutting's New York warehouse. Essentially, Nutting placed two orders for Margolis's reproduction of the same chest his own workers were reproducing. Margolis's cabinet makers made wooden templates of several elements of the chest, including the same three panels. Their interpretation of the Blinn chest is noticeably more faithful uh, in the pattern and the quality of the carving. Um, scholars debate whether Nutting ordered Margolis's reproductions to use as models for his own workers to study, though. Examination of Nutting's chests for the last, you know, decade or so after this shows no changes in their design. Harold Margolis believed Nutting's purpose was less than honorable. And while Margolis had sold him some genuine antiques over the years, Nutting had also bought several reproductions before, quote, a couple of chairs, a high boy and a low boy. And after a while, I saw them being offered for sale in his own catalog. In fact, illustrations were my own photographs that he had used, end quote. So one theory is that Nutting ordered the chests to resell as either one of his reproductions or as a genuine antique. And this, is easier, this was easier due to the fact that the Margolis shop used a very easily removable brass plate to label their furniture between 1925 and 1930. And so by the time Morris Schwartz ordered one more chest from the Margolis shop in June of 1930, the company had by then switched to using a burn stamp with a date to label their furniture. This piece you're looking at now, the piece you are looking at that is the Margolis chest was purchased by the Wadsworth Athenaeum in 2004 and includes the mark that identifies it as Margolis. And I've been unable to locate the ones that Schwartz acquired for nutting in the 1920s. But as fate would have it, the Margolis rendition of the sunflower chest became one of their most popular products, ordered 16 times between 1926 and 1930. 
people saw the original at the museum and went to Margolis to have a copy made. Or more likely, they saw one of Margolis's chests in the homes of their friends and neighbors who wanted one for themselves. And uh, I'll mention here, and I am happy to talk about this more, but, you know, the Jewish community of Hartford were uh, some of Margolis's biggest customers. And so this was a case of a lot of Jewish clients seeing this chest and wanting one for themselves. So suffice it to say, this kind of customer loyalty fueled the Nathan Margolis shop's continued success long after Wallace Nutting's furniture factory, which never made a profit, ceased operations in 1945. I like this case study because it kind of tells you everything you need to know, not only about the furniture, but the men who, quote, made them. The irony being that Jewish immigrants were better at reproducing America's colonial heritage than a former Anglican minister. So back to the shop. In the years following Nathan's death, Harold Margolis maintained his father's business and brand by emphasizing the prestige value of their furniture. He did this by reinforcing the similarities between their reproductions and the antiques found in major museum collections, going as far as to holding exhibitions of the furniture as a marketing tactic. The similarities between these display rooms and the period rooms at the Met or MFA Boston were meant to show potential clients that they too could basically recreate an American wing in their own home with the help of Margolis furniture. Another way that Margolis maintained their brand was by continually associating with the upper echelon of collectors and dealers in the antiques trade, including, of course, Israel Sack, whose son apprenticed with the Margolis shop in Hartford for a few years. These sorts of connections lent themselves to reciprocation. For example, in 1928, when Israel Sack auctioned the Palmer collection, agents acting on behalf of Henry Francis DuPont purchased an important Boston Bombay serpentine desk and bookcase, which you can see to the right. When the underbidder, Helen Temple Cook, expressed her supreme disappointment at losing the lot to H.F. DuPont, Sack offered to commission the Margolis shop to make her a replica. He obtained DuPont's permission and blessing to proceed with the project. And you can see the copy on the left when both of them are now at Winterthur. Such exchanges benefited both parties and is a testament to the strong bonds that tied Jewish immigrant entrepreneurs together in this trade. So I'm going to fast forward as I near the end here just to give you some highlights of the Margolis shop uh, in, in, the, in the World War II and post-war era. Under Harold's direction, the Nathan Margolis shop continued to make high quality reproductions long after many other cabinet making firms scaled up to reach a mass market audience. This paid off locally with a number of commissions to furnish public or civic interiors. The Connecticut Historical Society commissioned Margolis to restore armchairs and window stools uh, for the old state house. And in the 1940s, he was enlisted to make furniture for the Connecticut governor's mansion, which is still there today. In these and many other ways, the immigrant cabinet makers of the Margolis shop helped to shape the appearance of American exceptionalism before, during, and after World War II. The reputation and quality of the Nathan Margolis shop carried the business until 1973, when the high cost of materials coupled with a scarcity of skilled craftspeople caused the shop to close its doors. But even now, Margolis furniture continues to command high prices at auction, and over a hundred years after Nathan Margolis came to America, his furniture can now be considered antiques. Thank you. Thank you both so much for that really fascinating presentation. Um, I'd love to um, ask you just a couple of questions about really about um, Nathan Margolis and Israel Sachs um, legacy, their experience um, as immigrants um, and as entrepreneurs. So, so maybe we can start with that. Um, can you talk about their the issues they faced we we heard from you that the success that they they both built but how about um some of the issues as um as jews as immigrants as businessmen that they that they might have both faced maybe we should start a little bit on on that and talk about um facing anti-semitism also in the trade and and um, being being Jewish dealers, 
um, you know, I, I said the quote from from Henry, uh, Henry Ford about that, you know, Ford denied his, his uh, anti-Semitism based on his friendship with Sack. But it's certainly true that as, as Jewish dealers, um, that they, there was a lot of suspicion um, and that the, the issues of honesty were things that often um, were something that they had to counter in ways that uh, more native-born dealers did not. Um, not you know, in, in researching a number of dealers and in reading the collect the papers of collectors, you know, you do see all these kinds of stereotypes that they were facing of of you know eyeing things you know a dealer that eyed something sharply or um, you know a collector who specifically prohibited um, Jews from being from selling their wares or purchasing from Jewish dealers so that was certainly I think a, an important um, piece that they were facing as as dealers um, as Jewish dealers too Erica I'm sure you have examples of that as well Right, there's uh, this sort of uh, idea of the cabinet maker toiling away in the back of the antique shop who's, you know, either antiquing a piece of new furniture to make it look old or is, as you mentioned, uh, cobbling together old parts to make something new that was sort of a pervasive mythology. And uh, one that, you know, someone like Margolis really had to walk this tightrope because, you know, he allied himself with some of the, you know, most prestigious collectors and clients, and that was very important to him. Uh, but there was also this sort of acknowledgement by the field that, you know, Russian Jews were the experts and, you know, they were considered authorities and there was a little bit of resentment uh, by a lot of the, the so-called Yankee collectors and dealers. Uh, the fact that, you know, knowledge about America's heritage and furniture was coming from people who were not themselves American. And I think the that sort of was always present in the back of their minds. And I can't uh, think, for instance, of an example where Nathan Margolis uh, explicitly, you know, admitted to have being discriminated against. But you can also see that in relationships I've observed between collectors and cabinet makers who weren't Jewish, who did enjoy far more affectionate and familial relationships in their letters and correspondence to each other. And you really just don't see that with uh, Nathan and anyone else. Yeah, I think that we see that. I, I saw that a lot with Israel Sack in that sense of there were limits to how far um, he could go in those relationships. He served on a number of commissions and panels for American heritage, you know, redecorating the White House and, and charity auctions. Um, and in that, he was with, you know, some of the, the, the sort of big business families of the United States, but, you know, it was usually the wives. So it would be a Vanderbilt, but it would be the Vanderbilt wife and Israel Sack, right? And so there was this sort of ways in which um, even in the place where his expertise was being counted, um, that he was relegated to, um, you know, a kind of a second class uh, a role in some of the work. Right. Um, and what's interesting for Margolis is in some ways his his Jewishness was an asset for him in Hartford. Um, if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide, uh, as I mentioned before, you know, his customer base was a mix of Gentile and Jewish customers and especially in West Hartford, that growing Jewish community um, of upwardly mobile middle class Eastern European Jews who were not necessarily looking to their waspy neighbors for inspiration on how to look like you belonged. They were looking to already established Ger German Jewish um, neighbors, uh, people like the Foxes, uh, Beatrix Auerbach Fox. Uh, of the department store chain was someone in Hartford who was a big customer of Margolis's and kind of set the trend. And you can see here this interior of a house that was owned by Samuel and Sophie Gross, who were Yiddish speaking Russian Jewish immigrants who completely assimilated. And part of that process was by buying reproductions and more specifically Nathan Margolis furniture, which had become its sort of status symbol in Hartford.
Um, can you can you talk a little bit about um, the where SAC and Margolis fit in um, the larger context of, of American decorative arts? I'll let you start. Sure. <laughs> I think that you know for for SAC. You know, for both, for all of these men, right, they were, they were um, hidden behind, they were the advisors often to um, museum curators who were writing the sort of the definitive um, historiography of this work in terms of exhibitions and catalogs. SAC, the SAC family was a little conscious of this in the sense that particularly Israel Sachs' son, Albert, was writing and publishing. Now, not for the academic trade, but for instead uh, the, the mass market, more mass market consumer with his book as well, and with um, Fine Points of Furniture, which was then republished also, or re kind of updated and republished in the 1990s. So he was being deliberate in trying to use that that medium of publication and expertise in in ways, um, but again, much more often uh, the knowledge that SAC would have brought to the understanding of furniture, the discovery specifically of uh, individual craftsmen um, and who they were, their histories, um, the build, the construction techniques that they were using. You know, the Sack family was aware of that and was contributing to that construction of knowledge about early American furniture, but was not recognized um, in the same way that the the museum curatorships were. Yeah, it's a similar situation for Margolis uh, and for many of the other uh, immigrants in the trade. Uh, you know, when you settle in a place, you become sort of familiar with the craft tradition of that place. And Margolis, for instance, became very good at uh, recreating Connecticut River Valley furniture, the Chapins, Neeland and Adams. And, you know, the process of learning how to make a reproduction really gives you an education in that uh, crafts person style and techniques. And the case with Margolis, and you can also see this in New York City with uh, Ernest Hagen, who, you know, reproduced Duncan Fife's furniture so much and so well that he himself became sort of obsessed with Fife and did all this research. And this research forms the foundation for what we know about Duncan Fife today. Uh, and the same all over the place, this sort of amassing knowledge about a piece of furniture in order to reproduce it was its own sort of um, knowledge that benefited future generations of scholars because you had to know how to take a piece apart and know what, how it was put together. Uh, and that's a sort of invisible type of knowledge that you really don't hear much about. Uh, and it goes hand in hand with the work of restoring some of these great collections of American furniture that ends up at the Met or the MFA Boston. A lot of that work was done by Jewish immigrants who, you know, is is really the the invisible hand behind these beautiful collections of furniture. Um, this is such a fascinating story of, of, as you say, Russian Jews who became, you know, the the acknowledged experts in, in American um, cultural heritage. Can you talk, can you tell us a little bit more, and we're getting questions from the audience about, about their Jewish identities, whether they, in, as they were um, working in this world um, of, you know, sort of um, upper class American, um, you know, sort of gentility, um, were they were they able to maintain their Jewish identities and practices? Um, did they, um, um, you know, were they active in the Jewish community? Um, one person asked if if they actually acknowledged those Jewish networks that you that you mentioned earlier. So, can you tell us a little bit more about about their their Jewish lives? Sure. I think Sack, you know, the, the, the stories that he told very deliberately about um, adapting to other cultures, um, he was making the point that for him, he was, a, he was at least cloaking his Jewish identity, you know, and in his oral histories and in his, in his son's um, biography of the firm, really very little is mentioned about uh, that 
that part of their lives. And I think that that whether whether it was practiced at home and that identity piece at home was much more cultivated um, was was less the case of you know the desire to at least show um, acculturation and adaptability and and the idea that um, I think you know some of the things I've read Sack talk about why he loved American furniture particularly and that he saw himself in the tradition of the immigrants that had come before him and that was probably at, you know as close as he would sometimes come to to celebrating his identity as a Jewish immigrant but it was much much more for him in a public way to to make the connections um, to his adopted country I think Nathan was probably a little more more engaged um, in the Jewish community. Would you say that's true, Erica? Yeah, and I think that, you know, is, is, you know, attributed to the fact that he was in a area that was very heavily populated by Jews who kept, you know, sort of maintained uh, networks and, and social bonds between them. And I think Margolis, like I said, benefited from, uh, you know, being sort of a symbol of Jewish entrepreneurial success uh, and and was probably very proud of that fact. And uh, you know what what this furniture meant to him personally is less clear. I, I don't. I think you know reproductions in the colonial style were sort of a catch all for the sort of white middle class lifestyle. So I think they were objects used in the acculturation of Jews and other groups of immigrants. Uh, but I think for him personally, he just he when he was in London, he really just fell in love with the Chippendale style. He he really just loved this furniture uh, aesthetically and and I think really enjoyed making it. So I think it there's something kind of uh, separate from the the furniture itself and what it meant to his consumers. And I would say that Harold Margolis, uh, I think, remained pretty active in Hartford's Jewish community as well. They made furniture for Temple Beth Israel in the 1930s. Um, and, you know, they were, uh, as, like I said, associated with some of these prominent Jewish families. So I have no reason to believe that, you know, uh, his Jewish identity was in any way um, irrelevant to who he was as an entrepreneur and and as a businessman uh, and I think like with Israel Sack you put on different faces in different situations uh, but you know very much the 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 branding and the the store's profile that's what people saw they didn't necessarily go into the workshop they didn't necessarily you know see these men working so I think there is a, a difference there too between the public perception of the business and and who these people actually were yeah I do think that's too that the, the some of the supply chains um, relied upon networks of Jewish dealers uh, for Israel sack um, particularly, actually, I should say his son, Albert, was particularly close to the Liverant family of dealers in Colchester, Connecticut, um, Zeke and Nathan Liverant, um, and that they would pass kind of goods up um, the dealership hierarchy where the goods would command higher and higher prices. And that seems to be um, that those that some of those networks of of pickers and mid level dealers and higher level dealers, um, we do see a lot of associations of Jewish identity within the, with those communities as well. Right, right, and and among, you know who he's doing business with too. I mean, suppliers of uh, upholstery, of leather work, of mm -hmm. these sort of ancillary trades. Uh, you know, I don't have the statistics on who was you know in those trades, but I have no reason to believe he wouldn't be seeking out other Jews in those industries. Um, I'm I'm going to turn to um, uh, try to get to a few questions from the audience at this point. Um, there is a, um, a question from Charles asking how much pushback on their collective expertise did Israel, uh, did Sack and Margolis encounter from academia and museums because they didn't have the, the credentials that um, those entities would normally demanded from their peers? Well, I'll, I'll speak, you know, for 
Nathan Margolis, I don't think he ever had any um, intention or, you know, uh, Harold or Nathan, you know, that I think they worked well with museums. And in fact, they were given exclusive access to several very elite museums uh, to, to make those drawings and take those measurements. But I don't think it was necessarily that museums didn't want their knowledge or expertise. It's just I don't think reproductions as a category of furniture, I don't think they've yet to be really acknowledged by the scholarly community as these sort of significant and substantial um, works of art in many cases and i think that's because of the pervasive stigma of fakes and forgeries in the fields and i think you know men like nathan margolis are sometimes you know painted with the same brush and so i think we're now at this point where we're beginning to look at these beautiful reproductions and and what do they tell us about the the knowledge making and craft that was happening in the early 20th century and, and uh, as being legitimate in its own right. I think, I think that's really, really well said, Erica, um, as this knowledge was evolving. And, and SAC was really in many ways very early into the formation of collections and early um, into the, the moment when museums were beginning to pay attention to early American furniture. And so he was on that ground floor a bit of creating um, the knowledge base. And unless, I think, um, in that moment of formation, he wasn't being turned to for that, that knowledge. He does in, you know, in his oral history and, and in, in some of the family publications and family stories, you know, he makes some pretty deliberate, um, he tells some pretty deliberate stories that suggest that he was, was helping um, prominent collectors to sharpen their knowledge and to sharpen what was valued in, a, in an antique. I think there's a story where he tells that, you know, he went and saw um, Ford's, Henry Ford's collection and that Ford had done just terrible work, according to Sack, in terms of refinishing the objects and that he should have been maintaining more of the original finishes. And, you know, to what degree that is, you know, an after the fact Sack telling and asserting his authority and knowledge, um, I think, I, I think is, you know, one of those ways in which he was shaping his own legacy and, and calling out um, that he had um, knowledge that should have been, and he wished had been, right, um, being more mm -hmm. paid attention to, too. Yeah, what's interesting is, you know, our standards of authenticity, you know, the, are so much based in what these collectors and uh, were thinking about in the early 20th century. And when you take a look at you know what's actually going on is that in more cases than not, uh, collectors really don't have any clue what this furniture looked like. You know, so they will take something out of an attic or a moldy barn and they'll go to their trusty uh, dealer, advisor, restorer, and they'll say, "I think it, I think it looked like this. I want it to look like this." And, you know, this is a client customer, you know, relationship. So, you know, a lot of the times, uh, you know, these, these immigrant uh, cabinet makers would do the work of executing their client's vision and, you know, whether or not they thought it was the right move or not. And I think, you know, as you are more established in the field, you can probably push back against that. Uh, but ultimately, you know, you have, uh, a reproduction is is in many ways, you know, the w fulfilling the idealized version of what an antique ought to be. Uh, so there's lots of really interesting complications in that. Is like, what do we mean by authentic? Um, we are almost out of time, but we I have one um, last question from um, from the audience, which is uh, interesting and a little different. Um, and that is um, Nancy asking, did women fit in anywhere? Were there any women involved in this field? Boy, we've talked a lot about a lot of boys, haven't we? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, you know, I think one of the facets of the early early antique trade was the predominance of male collectors establishing um, 
establishing the field as as an elite one. And I think if you looked back a generation before, as often a lot of things are, um, you find a lot more female pioneers in the collecting field. And you do later on as well too. But there's, at the moment of professionalization or, you know, or canonization of this, uh, I, I see a lot of men dominating. Um, not to say that there weren't important women um, in the field, but that the that that moment, not surprising, where this you know takes off and becomes canonized and 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 professionalized, a lot of male voices. Yeah, one of the things that's kind of interesting is that um, you know the marketing of reproductions and the ways in which reproductions became sort of mainstream for the American public was the work of all of these women who are tastemakers and magazine editors and merchandisers, Nancy McClelland, Elsie DeWolf. I mean, these are people who are not only promoting colonial revival style as an American style and an appropriate style for the modern middle-class home, but are specifically advocating for well-made reproductions as uh, a, a way to distinguish yourself uh, from your neighbor. And if you have a Nathan Margolis reproduction that is itself uh, a status symbol, uh, you know, more so than having a matched suite of furniture coming out of Grand Rapids. So in terms of, you know, the longevity of reproductions, uh, that owes a lot to these women who are have the ear of the American housewife, who is more often than not making the choices for what goes in their home. Yeah, and at the same point, some of the, the antique collectors are trying to make a deliberate distinction in some ways to say these things are more than just household furniture, right? And I think that's one of the ways in which, or one of the inspirations to police the line between um, home decor and museum quality pieces. Um, it's all, of course, a construction, right, um, along those lines, too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you both so much. This has been so interesting. Um, if, if any of you, and, and, and I'm sorry we, we ran out of time for more questions, but if you do um, want to send your questions to us, um, you can email them to jhcreference at nehgs.org. Um, I want to thank all of you in our audience for joining us this evening. Um, we will be sending you an email following the webinar with a link to the presentation. Um, and you'll also be asked to take a brief survey about the program. Um, we appreciate your taking the time to fill out the survey as um, your feedback is really valuable to us to help us develop further programming. And I also want to mention that um, uh, upcoming um, program with the Jewish Heritage Center um, in two weeks. Um, we are having another webinar, Jewish and African American Cemeteries as Borders Uncrossed. Um, that's on Tuesday, December 1st, and you can find out more information um, and registration um, on our website, jewishheritagecenter.org, or at americanancestors.org slash education slash online classes. Also, if you're interested in antiques and the decorative arts, New England Historic Genealogical Society has just published a book about its own antiques and art collection uh, entitled Family Treasures. Um, we're offering a discount on that. Um, you can find it at shop.americanancestors.org. And if you fill in the um, code treasures, 1120 at checkout, you'll receive the discount. Um, thank you so much for, uh, again, for joining us. Um, I do want to mention that this free webinar uh, was made possible by contributions to the Weiner Family Jewish Heritage Center and New England Historic Genealogical Society from people all over the world. Um, please consider making a donation of your own to help us continuing to continue offering more free programs like this one. And thank you so much. Uh, I invite you to learn more about the Weiner Family Jewish Heritage Center on our website, jewishheritagecenter.org. We hope you'll join us again on December 1st. And until then, we wish you good health and a very happy Thanksgiving. Thank you.